Welcome to another episode of Conversations. Today we have Ambika Davy. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm I love so the happy. title of your show, Conversations. Oh, <laughs> I wish I could say I was the original thinker of that one, but I was not. But I, I always get compliments on it, so I wish I was the originator of that. Um, so your your list is long of all the things that we could be talking about today. And originally we were going to do numbers and numerology, but I kind of shifted focus here. And um, you call yourself a mind tamer. I do. And I love that title. So um, my thing is you said that the mind is out of us, not in, in here. External, like, yes. Right. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Psychology in the West and several systems consider mind and thought to be inside your brain. But yes. from an Eastern perspective, the mind is external. It is a bundle of thought. And it feeds us information. So we receive it through this gelatinous fatty thing called the brain. So the mind doesn't exist in the head. Uh, it is something that we connect with and we have cognitive uh, realizations of. But thought is not inside of you. It's everywhere. Mm. So when you call yourself a mind tamer, what do you mean by that? Is that um... well, when you tame something, you can either bully it into submission <laughs> or you could gently, you know, calm it into a passive state. And to tame the mind, we learn to meditate, but many people have a difficulty with this. And <laughs> I am guilty. And then, there, and then there are different ideas about what is meditation. Is it a focus on something? Or is it an emptying? What does it mean when certain groups tell us, make your mind, is it your mind or is it the mind? Make it as smooth as a glassy lake. What the heck does that mean? You know, so there yeah. there have been all of these different confusions about meditation. And I set out in this lifetime to help people understand how to calm down thought. So a mind tamer is one who can back up and witness the thought rather than become re-reactive in it. So when we've got something going on, whether it's excitement or it's something frustrating, either way, we're reacting, right? Mm -hmm. So when we become involved in thought, we begin to loop. Did you ever notice that? How yes. I'm obsessive about a thought or not even willingly, the thought just keeps coming. And this happens a lot when we're thinking about ourselves or a situation or conversation that took place and to tame the mind, because when you begin listening to me, you'll start getting tools. So you're automatically a mind tamer in training and you start to understand, I am not this body. I am not these thoughts. I am the witness of this body and this mind or these thoughts. Because if you close your eyes, can you still see what's going on around you? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you remember, I remember I've got my eyes closed. I can reach for my cup and get it. No problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I wasn't using my physical eyes. Okay, who, who saw the cup? Who knew where it was? If you close your eyes and you try to focus on a single thing, maybe a prayer, a mantra, uh, a word, a color, a sensation, how long can you keep the focus? That's challenging. Yeah. But then who's watching? Who? Who or what is focusing? What about when you dream? I'm fascinated by dreams. Yeah, me too. And I keep journal on, on my dreams. Uh, and I always have. And I have buddies that I talk to about dreams when there's a, a doozy. And, <laughs> <laughs> or I, I have prophetic dreams. I mean, the other day I dreamt about 
beings that I do not recognize, humans that I do not know. And if you were a reader of uh, the teachings of Don Juan, you learn about phantoms in the dreams. Uh, there are there are different schools of thought, but uh, that book just came to mind. And these are not necessarily to be trusted energies or or entities that creep mm -hmm. into our dreams. And I had a dream like this last week where I confronted and the dream was very lucid. Lucid is when we have control over what's going on in the dream. And we realize, whoa, I'm in a dream. This is a, a form of yoga. It's a form of meditation to have the body fully at rest and then the, the connection with the mind fully activated. So it's not disturbing the body. The body's still getting its rest and right. rejuvenation. And I, I was in, I found myself in a very lucid situation and I spoke the name of the being. Uh, well, she or it told me their name. The next day I had an encounter with someone with that first name. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Yeah. Very do you, interesting. Do you usually dream like that? Prophetically? Yeah. Uh, I can. I can. I can induce it if I want. I prefer to just sleep and go away at night. <laughs> but uh, if something's about to happen, yep, I, I absolutely do. Wow. Uh, and uh, meditation is closely related to our psychic abilities. It's the similar area of this brain inside the head that is activated and works on that. And there are certain practices beyond meditation, which uh, can induce or deter that ability to, I'm going to say capture mm -hmm. the information. We all have the same abilities. We're, we're all built pretty much the same. Uh, we treated our bodies differently, mm -hmm. you know, especially the surfaces and, uh, oh, and most definitely the insides with food. Right. And there are, there are certain things that, you know, one school will tell you, this is really good for you because it has this and this and this in it. And then another school will tell you that's poison. It's killing off this or, you know, so we've got to really do our research and understand all of it. Yeah. It's... And that's frustrating because it's like, you don't know who or what to believe. I mean, you can have somebody that seems or sounds very credible, but then you turn around and somebody else comes and says that person doesn't know what they're talking about. That is, and that makes it so frustrating as yeah. a, just a human being to know, you know, oh, I'm going to take these supplements because I, I heard that they're good for you. And then somebody mm. else says, you don't need those supplements. Just get it in your diet. And you're like, yeah, but which diet? Because <laughs> this diet's supposed to be good. And then somebody else says this diet's terrible. It's just, it's mad. That's a really good question. That happens to be something a friend of mine asked me to host a webinar on. So I do have a private recording. If you want to watch it, Everybody, you have to message me. It's not publicly listed. But um, we were talking about Ayurveda in the green room before we started recording. And my book, Unfolding Happiness, is an introduction to Ayurveda, which is a sister science to yoga. Most people think yoga is just the postures. Yoga yeah. is a science of life. It, it Ayurveda is part of it. Ayurveda is for the physical world. But Ayurveda does teach us that Everything you need to be healthy as far as food goes should be in your kitchen. And I like right. to add to that. If it's not, let's talk about what's in your kitchen. Because I, I'm 64 and I stand on my head every day. Mm -hmm. And I do yoga and I still experiment with new practices. This is also an introduction to cosmology, which is the... Uh, great grandparent of astrology and divination systems and also meditation which yoga equals meditation so most people think yoga is for stretching your muscles when they first see it it's actually for loosening your joints it's the muscles and ligaments that are gripping around the joints so when you think about it and back up you think oh okay so if i'm stretching the 
stretchier fibers of the body, then I'm giving more space to the hard tissue that needs to move mm -hmm. in order for me to be mobile. I think if we can slow down, Don, and we can back up, we can begin to see more clearly on many, many topics. Right. Well, and I know you're new, new, new stuff all the time. And right. it's just the inventions or taking a fragment and saying, this is it, you know, and I see this all the time. Yeah. And I will, with, with respect, try it out and then get to the place where I go, okay, that's where you fell apart, you know, right. it happens. Yeah. And we were talking about that too, before, um, before I hit record about the angel numbers and you said, that's just kind of a modern term. And that's another thing that happens, you know, not just with the diets and the supplements and all that stuff. It's just that you, you people rename things and then you think everybody starts to, Oh, you know, manifestation and law of attraction and all that stuff. And right, right, right. it's like, it's brand new and, and, somebody like you that's been studying it for years and years, you're like, that's not brand new. <laughs> or, I mean, or it's a weird combination. You know, look, food has been invented, right? There was cheesecake <laughs> and there was pumpkin pie. And somebody mixed the two batters by accident and made pumpkin cheesecake. Right. 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 Yeah. So sometimes it works out, but then back when I was living in Arizona decades ago, I was, I had retired from teaching. Oh no. I think I was retired from teaching Shiatsu and Oriental pathology. I had worked in physical body work for many, many years and teaching. And I actually wrote some of the questions on the national exam here mm. in the U S and part of their code of ethics. Uh, before that, there was a little organization overseeing massage therapy. And, you know, so there's a time jump and, a, and an organizational jump. That happens in many of the physical practicing, uh, practicing arts mm -hmm. um, for health and healing. And uh, I've been an astrologer since the 70s. I did go to school for it. I have a college title in astrology and I'm trained in acupuncture. Okay. So two of those arts. So there was this, uh, invention of something called human design. Oh yeah. Maybe, maybe you've heard yeah, of it. I've heard of it. Yep. I've had an episode. Seems on to it. be having a reprise right now. <laughs> and, uh, the gentleman who channeled it, called on me and some other people to give him evaluation and feedback on it. And I said, man, you know, and chakras, well, chakras are, are from, uh, from yoga and right. Right. The whole study is from the, there and he had chakras, he had acupuncture, he had meridians, he had organs, he had, okay, this is, many of these are in my wheelhouse. Right. I have a big, have a big wheelhouse. You do. <laughs> so I looked at this and I said, man, you have too much in this soup. It's beyond goulash. <laughs> but people love it. So if they want to eat it, great. But I mean, I was, I had done, even before I met him, I was translating, uh, going over translations in compendiums that were, that were books for acupuncturists. I, I have a thing for language. I really like language. And when mm -hmm. I studied acupuncture, I learned from someone in, he was an English speaker, but taught me all of the sutras of the points in the body in Japanese, even though I had studied Chinese in high school. So I, I was studying, I was going through their, uh, it was like an encyclopedia and checking to see that uh, Chinese to Japanese to Latin to English was correct. Whoa. Mm. Oh my gosh. That just, I you know, I, I mean, I'm a nerd, okay? <laughs> Don't try and fool me with your new packaging. Right, right. Because I will be able to show you all the yeah. fibers in it. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's some surge going on now about the word fascia, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Now, when I taught body work, when I taught people to be massage therapists, I talked about fascia and the cross diagonal wiring of the body and why it's important. And if you've ever been to a chiropractor, you've been twisted to be adjusted, right? Right. And so when you were a baby, you were in a, a crossed little ball. Right. So it does make sense to put people in those positions to help them get to certain places. If you're practicing yoga properly, you're doing these postures, but some of them may not be so easy. And and uh, so now I'm hearing the term fascia used like it's a blanket or it's a layer. Yes, that's how but I understood it too. I taught anatomy and physiology. So let's let's just look at the word fascia. Fascia, if you are a meat eater, forgive me, vegans and vegetarians, you've walked <laughs> your through ears. grocery stores. <laughs> Maybe you go like this when you walk by the meat, but it's usually there. And you've probably noticed at some point, maybe a friend or somebody cooking it, uh, that there's something that looks a little bit like saran wrap, the coats. Yeah, yeah. Muscle structure. That's fascia. But okay. every muscle, let's talk about my bicep, there are bundles of muscle fibers in here. And I can take a bicep and pull it apart. And around each of those bundles is a layer of fascia. And then I can take that bundle and pull it apart. And each fiber has a layer of fascia. Interesting. And I can pull that apart. And each little bit has fascia. So it's not some magical mystery layer. Yeah. It's everywhere. Just That's like so mucus is. <laughs> yeah. There's mucus all over you inside of you. It's the goo that is helping things stick together. Right. You know this because I know you all picked your nose. <laughs> you know how strong that stuff is. <laughs> Let's get over it. Okay. <laughs> but are some of these systems working? Yeah, they absolutely are. Have I experimented with them? Yes, I absolutely do. Have I added them into what I do with yoga? Yeah, some of them I have. Well, then you, but, you then you're testing you know, them out. So that's good. I am. I am. But it does, it does kind of make me go, ah, when I hear a term like quantum. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I studied, I studied quantum mechanic equation and it was the study of the traveling of particles somewhere i think it was in the 1800s well quanta as a word means uh, an amount mm -hmm. and it was a battery company that used the term quantum leap in their advertising and then now how many coaches and trainers are you know quantum this and quantum that but there's this part of my head that keeps going back to the schrodinger's equation which is how you map out the traveling of quarks which are even smaller they're they're we're talking particle tiny right and measuring their speed and velocity and that's tiny so quantum physics is the study of tiny stuff. So I don't know. Does it make sense to me to say quantum leap? To me, I get it if you're saying quanta yeah. leap, but not quantum. I don't know. Some, you know, is in there. But, you know, I go off on this. <laughs> Do you think it's important that people are be uh, becoming more open-minded because of terminology and things like that kind of being renamed and made to seem more modern. Do you think that that's good? Or do you think it's just creating a bunch of misinformed people walking around? I guess it depends on which spiritual path you walk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> In some of them, they say that, you know, there'll be many people standing on soapboxes preaching at us, you know, should we listen to them and right. others, in others, they say, shh, <laughs> don't talk, live alone, you'll be happy. Right, right. <laughs> don't listen. Um, off topic, what is Sanskrit? You mentioned that earlier, and I have heard that term. And I Sanskrit? I yep. I'll say it in its native tongue. Sanskritam is Ooh. a language. And what is it? A language of what? It's the mother tongue. <laughs> Latin, Latin grammar comes from it. Okay. Therefore, all the Latin languages come from it. Okay. All the Asian languages come from it. 
the uh, Tibetan Buddhists use a version of it. Hindi is the same alphabet, but different pronunciations on some of the characters. Interesting. So it is the language that books, including the Vedas, which is what I study uh, voraciously, the Bhagavad Gita, which I continue to study mm -hmm. also, which is 18 chapters in the Mahabharata, all the chanting you hear yogis do, that's all Sanskritam, Sanskrit. Okay. okay. My name, my name is Sanskrit. Okay. Uh, how long have you so been using that name? Uh, since it was given to me. Okay. Yeah, it was given to me by a Swami at Shivananda Ashram. Oh my gosh. That's just so <laughs> fascinating. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, Vedic... Yeah, you said of, that okay. perfectly. Awesome. Um, so w they have little quizzes that you can take, and I've gotten both. Oh, the Ayurveda you're talking about. Yes. Ayurveda. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. In my book, there's a really great quiz, actually. So, um, so you're not opposed to quizzes when, okay. Oh, no, this is a great way, because unless you're a really good astrologer, or numerologist, actually, you can you can see the dosha in numerology. It's fascinating, um, but uh, really, to answer, yeah, quizzes are great. Well, because sometimes people think that they're not. They say oh, you need really? to get more in depth than that, or not necessarily. Well, for oh, the Vedas, okay, I, but I, just... I, I I get that because, for instance, as a career coach, I'll say uh, I'll ask my client, "Have you ever taken a Myers Briggs test?" Uh, yeah, yeah, I took one. Uh, well, which one did you take? Did you pay for it, or was it only you yes. know, eighteen questions? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Because there's quizzes right. aplenty. <laughs> right. And so when know. when we built uh, the quiz in this book, we really it's extensive. It's it's really good. And there's two quizzes in my book. One of how you came into this world, what your dosha was. And then where you're at with it right now to show whether it's in harmony or in dissonance. Is your, and, the dosha that you're born with, does that never change? It stays the same your whole life or does it change through stages in your life? That's a really good question. So, uh, yes, you, you are born with certain propensities, potentials. Okay. For instance, you're born with a certain color of eye and hair, but over time things change, right? Yeah. Uh but with dosha, yeah, you have you have a root. Okay. And it's a it's a nine choice possibility. So there's nine possible, including one of those would be tree doshic. So there's there's three doshas and then there's three sub doshas. Okay. And so you would have a, a dominant one and a and a subdominant one. Okay. So and you've got the pitta, the kappa. What's the other one? Vata. 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 Okay. Vata pitta kappa. And if you are eating a certain way that doesn't agree with you, that means you're going against that. Dasha. Oh, this is now you're now you're you're heading back towards that webinar I dropped a a tiny little truth little uh thought bomb on earlier. Uh I I there's so many different ways, you know, okay. when it comes to eating. And I and I know and I I honor so many people want to help people to feel healthier. Yeah. But there are things I'm gonna try and do it in a nutshell. Uh the information that Peter Dottimo researches and continues to write and research about on blood type super important doshas also very important uh then also what about your body type you might be uh have a more slight body and you might need to eat more frequently or you might have a very heavy body and you don't need to really eat hardly at all mm -hmm. and you might have a body that burns very hot so you need to eat more regular and regimented and mm -hmm. uh, all of these can be seen in Ayurveda absolutely but Ayurveda might tell you to eat things that you don't want to or don't agree with you and then remember I come from oriental traditional oriental mm -hmm. medicine traditional Chinese medicine, where the truth 
is everything in moderation. So you, oh. you have to figure it out, right? Um, I will tell you this in my years of working in clinics, when people were not eating right for their blood type, they were making themselves sick. Gosh. But you can run into a lot of a lot of issues. Look, Peter, who wrote that information uh, in into books, what I love that he says is if you feel great, ignore everything. Mm. But if something's going on, you might want to pay attention to this. So have I seen his ideas prove themselves? Yes, time and time again. Do I question? the use of items as per the blood types as being touted as this is what you need. Oh, I question them heavily. For instance, I'll just use a couple examples. If we look at the eat right for your blood type information, yeah. and there's only four blood types, right? They're broken into secretor and non-secretor, meaning the antigen shows up. The antigen is what tells you your A, B, O, mm -hmm. or A, B. Uh, in only 18% of humanity, the antigen doesn't show up in anything but the blood. So it doesn't show up in the lymph, the saliva, the tears, the sweat, uh, the sexual fluids. Um, and that 18% isn't going to react like the other 82% of that same blood group. And I got the opportunity to prove that with a group of acupuncturists back in the 80s. And it turned out I'm in that 18% because hmm. I couldn't figure out why I was feeling lousy and everybody in my group was feeling great. And then years later, when I met Peter and I did get tested to see if I, he didn't even have the secretor, non-secretor information back then. Wow. But then when I found out and he retested all the foods again, it turned out what I was eating that was great for all the secretors in my blood group, which is type A. That for non-secretors, there were two things in particular I was eating that were wrong for me. Mm -hmm. And it, as I look back, every time I ate them, I was happy eating them, but I felt sluggish or not so good. And I was getting, I was getting colds and things all the time. And it was corn. And I, when I stopped eating that, boy, did I feel better. Oh my Actually, gosh. somebody gave me a couple ears of corn last summer and I didn't want to be rude. And I ate them. I felt like crap for three days. And uh, you can prove it to yourself that way. When you go off of what was disturbing you and you go back and you eat it, you'll know right away. And then, and then uh, I had so many people over the years come to me with what they thought was the flu. And when I discovered they were B-type blood and they were eating a lot of chicken or they were eating a lot of legumes, like lentils, uh, that and they were using coconut and they were breaking out, they were using soaps with coconut oil, then when they stopped, it went away. That's so interesting. So it takes time. I mean, to be able to understand all of the blood groups and mm -hmm. the secretor, non-secretor, uh, it, it takes time and you have to be patient. I mean, you you can't, I, I, I see people out there talking about blood type, right? And I was in a networking thing with someone who was like, I am now talking about blood type and oh my gosh, it's so amazing and it's changing my life. And I said, oh, that's cool. Did, did you study with Peter? And they said, who? I said, Peter Dottimo. And they said, mm -mm, crickets, right? <laughs> I said, he's the one who wrote the book, Eat Right for Your Blood Type. He and his father and his grandfather have been doing this research. No clue. I said, what about secretor, non-secretor? No clue. So yeah, be careful. <laughs> right. Well, Make sure and you're listen talking to, to people who are really paying attention. Right. And listen to your body listen to your body. Your body's the, the end all judge of what should be going in right, your body. Because you might, you might be like me, you know, if you're just using the secretor information and you don't know you're a non-secretor, then you might feel yucky from eating certain things. And, oh, don't even start me on coconut oil <laughs> <laughs> or cashews. Mm -mm. So what made you write your book? 
Unfolding happiness. <laughs> Un well, sorry. Yes, you do have multiple books. Unfolding yeah. happiness. Cause that is totally a book that I would, I would pick up. I would want to. Well, to we, have, we have to start with Lilith because Lilith is my first book and, okay. and it is my, it's a fiction novel and it's really about me. So if you want to get to know me, at least uh, in part of my life, uh, definitely pick that one up. And the day that went to print, I was meeting with VJ Jane, who's the co-author of this book, uh, of Unfolding Happiness. And he said, would you help me write a book? Well, I ended up becoming the publisher and taking over my publishing rights of Lilith, and I ended up writing this book. Okay. So uh, I learned a lot about Ayurveda from VJ and wrote this book for us. And then I have a poet friend named uh, Dominic Albanese, and he is a very famous poet writing about Vietnam. And oh my God! He's in the original Vietnam vet uh, documentary, and now I think Netflix is considering making a documentary about him. So Netflix, I'm over here. Uh, I want to be in that documentary because I have a lot to say about Dominic, and uh, he was writing about war and anger and frustration, and he was suffering every year from some sort of emotional stuff around the holidays, and it would last from uh, Christmas to Easter or the other way around. And I said, Dominic, you write some beautiful love poetry, and you love the river, and you love water and fishing and things like that. So I want to make a book for us of poetry where our poems are having a conversation back and forth. And so that's oh. what The Wizard and the Ranch is about. And I was teaching at a school of wizardry, teaching psychic arts, but using meditation as the modality. Then I wrote a goddess book, which is an e-book. And, uh, and then during the pandemic lockdown, I wrote Cupid is a Bastard, <laughs> which is about love. And self-love, so and it, it started, thank you, it started <laughs> with a conversation between myself and Cupid after I had an a ghosting experience okay, yes. from, from an internet date, mm -hmm. and it just started as a very cheeky kind of, you know, I mean, it's fantasy, me talking to Cupid, right? Yeah. And uh, I happened to be in a, in a writing group that day where somebody from the writing industry was there. And I usually name things so I can find them in my computer later. And I had already named it the little short story, <laughs> Cupid is a Bastard. And she didn't know she had her mic open, which we learned about stuff during Zoom, like don't take your laptop to the toilet with you. <laughs> and now we're, you know, advancing to turning your mic on and off, right? Right, and, right. Or sometimes we forget, right. and uh, which I demonstrated earlier. And uh and she blurted out, oh, my God, that's a great title. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go buy that URL, you know, so I yeah. did. And I had been writing a lot of poetry. I, I write my dreams down, as I said. And sometimes I'll reformulate things like dreams or uh, poetry into flash fiction, like little micro fiction or short fiction. And uh, and so that's what this book is. It's it's very much a memoir. It's got photography and uh, it's got drawings. Oh my and, gosh, I love and it. And it's got chocolate in it. It's got um, <laughs> it's got quotes, a lot of really great quotes by Shakespeare, who I adore. He's always with me. Oh and, my uh, gosh, <laughs> is that a finger puppet? It is. It's a Shakespeare. <laughs> And he's got a magnet in his head so I can stick him on my mic stand. Oh um, my and so I, I, and there's some recipes in here because as I was editing this, my editor said, you know, it's Cupid um, and you've got some pretty awesome chocolate recipes. Why don't you put some of those in the book? And I went, you know, that's a cool idea. And then also I had aromatherapy books from back when I taught uh, holistic health that I'd never published. And I, I felt kind of guilty about that because they, they're good recipes. So I published some of those and I love tea. That's what I drink, everybody. I drink it out of coffee mugs, but I am a tea drinker. I just like bigger amounts. And 
Uh, and so I put some tea recipes in here also. And uh, one of my favorites is called chill the flower out. <laughs> and it's really good for hormone balancing. And I am going to say that. Yeah. Uh, because uh, as I said earlier, I'm 64. So right. yes, I did go through that, you know, hormonal shifting twice because we go through it when we're teenagers and then we have to go through it again it when the energy is shifting from going down to going <laughs> up right and uh that recipe really helps it helps with sleep and it it helps chill you the flower out you know <laughs> i love it you're just a wealth of information i just cannot even imagine what it would be like to go inside your head <laughs> What's in there? <laughs> oh, what was, what was that John Malkovich movie where you went inside his head? Oh Lord, that would be scary. <laughs> I wonder which floor would definitely be on the 13th and a half floor if you're going inside my head. I love it. <laughs> well, tell people how they can find you. Where you are you You can at? find me at my website at ombukadevi.com. And for those of you who are listening and not watching because I just pointed to my name on the screen, <laughs> which is ever so rude in a voice only platform. It's my name, which is A-M-B-I-K-A-D-E-V-I. That's A-M-B-I-K-A-D-E-V-I.com. <laughs> And uh, you can find all my socials and, oh, for goodness sake, follow me on Instagram, please. Um, if I could get to 2000, I would throw a party. <laughs> <laughs> Those numbers. Thank you so much that? for being on my show. I just love listening to you. You're so interesting. I might have to have you back on. We can do some I more. hope so. Okay. I would love to. Yeah. I would love it. Well, thank you so much. And I'll be in touch. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye.